Thank you. Uh, this title sounds like what you would give when you don't know what you want to talk about. Uh, but actually, I'm going to devote a substantial part of this uh, talk to try to describe to you uh, the kind of uh, opportunities and challenges that we are facing now in, in this field. And there are amazing developments. And uh, then I will talk briefly about a single project that I was involved in. But uh, first, uh, Dick. So uh, there is an idiom in Hebrew, Mori Rabbi. It literally means uh, my teacher and my rabbi. And what it means is uh, a teacher and a role model and someone that you admire and that you uh, would like to follow. And in fact, Dick, you have been Mori Rabbi and in many opportunities along my career. Uh, uh, a good Occam's razor to decide what to do when it comes to students or uh, refereeing or teaching is what Dick would have done. So uh, this is uh, Dick's uh, co-author graph uh, according to Microsoft Academic Research. Uh, you should, one should take it with a grain of salt. For example, if you look at Tao Jiang, he looks a little different in this uh, picture, and so does Iran Halperin. But I guess that uh, most of the information is uh, correct, and uh, I just uh, looked at this uh, this week, and I was uh, happy to see that I think I'm sharing the largest number of papers with Dick. Many of them also with uh, students of mine uh, who were uh, also Dick's postdocs and uh, they are now uh, independent researchers by uh, themselves. Uh, here is one example of uh, one of those 20-odd uh, papers that we wrote together. It's in computational biology. And uh, the reason I bring this up is that I think uh, it's uh, some kind of, uh, of a record, because if you look at the uh, author's list, uh, you see that it's four generations. So uh, Dick was my advisor, Rodet Sharon was my student, and uh, Sharon was his student. And if this is not enough, the fifth author of this paper, Falk Hufner, at the time, he was a postdoc of mine. As a result of this work, married Sharon. So uh, it, it must be some kind of a record. Uh, I, think, I think one thing that I would like to emphasize is really Dick's uh, contribution to computational biology. Uh, Dick actually got into this field uh, very early, before the term bioinformatics was uh, invited. And uh, he, his uh, stature and his participation in the community uh, helped a lot to uh, make uh, computational biology or bioinformatics a legitimate discipline. So the fact that really Dick was deeply involved and was also on the steering committee of, Redi of RECOM, the leading uh, theoretical conference in the field has really made a, a, a great impact. Now, uh, let me tell you a little bit about the challenges that we face today. We are talking about the interaction or marriage of biology and computation, and this is not a new thing. So if you the modern history of uh, biology starts with uh, the piece of Gregor Mendel, and already there, uh, probability theory comes uh, very clearly into the game. Uh, the discovery of the double helix by Watson and Crick also required mathematical deciphering of uh, X-ray diffraction. Uh, and of course, the genome project that uh, the uh, was completed in about 12 years ago uh, involved a numerous number of highly complex computational challenges, including uh, assembly of the genome, which can be described as putting together a puzzle of some 27 million pieces. So 
Computation has been accompanying biology all along the way, and it's even more true today because I think we are just inside a tsunami of genomic information. So this is a, a recent uh, uh, graph showing the number of sequences uh, and the bases in the, uh, in the largest uh, database uh, that summarizes this information. And you see that the, gr the growth is exponential, and it continues to be exponential for some uh, 30 years. Uh, and the, the, the reason is uh, a series of revolutions in terms of technology, uh, which each one uh, scales up the amount of data that one can generate, uh, and, and this keeps growing. So here is a, a recent uh, summary of the cost per raw megabase of DNA sequence. Uh, so at the time of the Human Genome Project, uh, single genome sequencing cost about $3 billion. Uh, and you see the, uh, the scale going down exponentially, and there is a big uh, dip around uh, 2008, where uh, a new sequencing technology got in. And uh, interestingly, the, this seemed to be leveling up for some time, but now we see another dip. Uh, and one could uh, hypothesize why, why is that. Uh, if you look at the cost per genome, as I said, uh, compared to the, uh, as the year of the Human Genome Project, we are now pretty close to the level of one thousand dollars uh, per genome. Just for comparison, an MRI scan that is uh, routine in hospitals costs about three thousand dollars. So we are in a situation where really sequencing one's DNA is within reach technologically, and it could be very quickly become part of the information that we carry and is uh, stored in our uh, medical record. And uh, indeed, uh, about a year ago, uh, maybe a little more, it was announced that there is a machine like this that can sequence in uh, about a million dollars, a, a thousand dollars. If, if you look at the numbers, uh, it has to be very large scale in order to amortize the equipment and the reagents, etc. But uh, it is, as of this year, becoming a reality. And the point is that if you look at the numbers, uh, such a, a machine will generate uh, 600 billion bases per day. So this, of course, creates enormous uh, problems uh, in all aspects of the analysis. So the, the number of challenges is really staggering, and their uh, uh, scope, uh, just storing and transferring this information is becoming a huge problem. Some of the, these big centers cannot really convey the information over the internet, so they just use trucks or, you know, disks uh, carried by uh, taxis to move them around. Of course, one needs to compress, uh, to search, even to just find a new sequence and compare it to everything that is known is becoming a tremendous uh, task. Uh, assembling the sequence, uh, analysis that is done jointly over many individuals or many species, uh, and all aspects of other types of data except DNA sequence that is, uh, that is also speeding up uh, very quickly and uh, how to integrate them is really a tremendous challenge today. And of course, uh, when one wants to combine this DNA information with the uh, medical records, uh, there are tremendous issues of privacy and how to really analyze this data in an integrative fashion. And in terms of computer science, uh, theoretical computer science, all this, the, the tools of the, of the trade are coming in. Uh, and uh, there's a lot of work uh, waiting to be done. And remember this exponential graph. It's not stopping uh, anytime soon. And it's much faster than Moore's law. 
So uh, we really need to do new things about uh, analysis of this data. So this is just one example. We are looking here, if you look at this uh, red dot on the top line, it shows uh, the segment of uh, chromosome 21 of about uh, 10,000 bases. And each row that is seen on this picture is one type of information that we have about this sequence. So uh, we see here about a dozen rows, and if you go uh, further down, there are uh, about 100 different types of additional data. And this is for any segment along the genome. So this is extremely highly multi-layered type of data, and uh, there is a lot that can be learned by integrating it, and uh, most of the problems are, are still waiting for a solution. And uh, I, I think in many places around the world, including in uh, England and in the United States, uh, during the last year it was realized that uh, we are now ready uh, for the era of personalized uh, medicine, where we could combine the medical inf information from electronic health records and the, and the uh, DNA sequences and uh, really make a tremendous uh, change in, in the way uh, medicine is, is practiced. And here comes the, the real bioinformatics opportunity because uh, having the $1,000 genome is uh, something that we were hoping for for 10 years. This is a paper from about nine years ago. And the same author, five years later, also realized that getting the data is going to be the easiest part of all. So the analysis is becoming uh, the bottleneck in terms of uh, cost because as of now it is done mainly by uh, uh, semi, uh, semi-automatic ways with a lot of manual intervention. And uh, by combining all these types of data, we are uh, almost on the verge of the era of personalized medicine where one would uh, uh, have his uh, DNA on a disc and key. When you go to the doctor, the, the uh, medication and the treatment that, we, that you will get will be tailored to your uh, uh, genome. But, of course, this is a, at this point a dream, and there is a tremendous amount of sophisticated computation that uh, should uh, uh, be studied, analyzed, and, uh, uh, and really carried out in order to be able to do it. And this is exactly where uh, people of uh, computation, algorithms, theory can make uh, a big difference. So let me tell you just in a few uh, minutes about one project that we were involved in. This was done main, mainly by Didi Amar, a PhD student in my group, uh, and uh, Adi uh, Maron Katz, another PhD student, they co-supervised with uh, Talma Handler, a neurologist at uh, one of the hospitals in Tel Aviv, and Daniel Kutieli, who is a, a statistician at Tel Aviv University. So, uh, in many type of types of data, uh, we have uh, matrices that we analyze, and specifically, let's think about the matrix of uh, genes time, time subjects. So, for each subject, we have a vector of about 20,000 genes, and the value in each entry is just the uh, activity of this gene. And uh, the classical thing that uh, has been well studied, both in theory and in practice, is uh, clustering, namely partitioning the rows into groups where within each group uh, the values are similar and uh, between groups the values are different. Going one step further, one can think about bi-clusters when one looks for subsets of both the rows and the columns. There, there could be overlaps and the and the uh, space is larger. And both of these have been very uh, 
extensively studied, uh, we, are, we were looking at the more complex data that is uh, becoming available in large scale, and this is three-way data. So we have a matrix for each subject where the rows are the measured object, like the gene expression values, and the columns are time points. So we measure the values for each subject uh, multiple times, uh, and, we, and we get uh, a set of vectors. So the classical example is gene expression, but uh, we also came to this from uh, brain research, where uh, by measuring the activity of, uh, of actually of blood flow in the brain, one can get a vector of about 100,000 values, which tells the uh, level of activity at each voxel. And if one uh, wishes to somehow uh, reduce the dimension, uh, the, the one can partition the brain to about a thousand regions called parcels that have a, a coherent uh, function. And so you get, for each individual, each measurement gives a vector of, uh, say, uh, uh, 1,000 parcels. And again, this is measured over time. The fMRI machine can produce uh, a vector like this about every three seconds. So you get about 100 vectors like this. So, and you do this for multiple subjects. And the question is, how do we analyze it? Now, the problem is that uh, the data is not synchronous. Ideally, one would have liked to find a 3D uh, subcube of the space and use it. But uh, the reality is asynchronous, and therefore, it's much more difficult. So if we just have one single subject, multiple time points for one subject, then we could use a, a bi-clustering. And there have been quite a few uh, methods developed by uh, the community for this, including one by uh, my group that does this uh, quite well. However, uh, when you have multiple subjects, it's not necessarily that the signal is consistent. So suppose, for example, only a, a subset of the subjects are relevant. Maybe the others uh, are not. So we need to identify this subject subset of the subject. We need to identify the time points that need not be the same for each individual. And we also need to find the gene set that is relevant, uh, which uh, simplistically one would think about uh, finding the same set across all subjects. But this is too rigid and doesn't reflect the fact that the, pr the data is asynchronous. And therefore, uh, we would want to allow uh, some uh, missing uh, values and some additional values uh, beyond the same set. So think about this uh, uh, light blue set A as the core uh, set of this uh, module. But there are changes we were shown here in dark blue uh, for each of the subjects in the set. So here is the, the, mod, the model schematically, or the components of the module. We have a core module, which is a subset of the subject. Here are uh, one, two, and five. A uh, uh, subset of the rows. These are the light blue rows. And uh, possibly different subset of time points for every subject. Uh, and uh, there is also a subject-specific part to each model shown here in uh, dark blue. And if you see uh, for subject five, there is also some part of uh, the core module that is missing. So all these modification and extension behind, be, beyond the basic 3D cube structures are a, a part of our assumption. OK, so uh, and, and how would we model this? Uh, the simplest way to do this is to, sim to assume that there is some difference between the distribution of the values in the background and within the modules. So values in the white area will have a certain distribution, and values in the, in the blue areas will have a different distribution. So this could be both binary and also real valued. And for real valued, we just make the simplest assumption that uh, 
the, these are normal distributions, but the values are uh, distinct, different uh, means and standard deviation. So this brings us to the generative model and uh, going back to our example. So we have, uh, uh, we define the core uh, model by uh, the set of core model rows, the dark blue rows, and the set of relevant subjects. So here is one, two, and five. And then the combination of the core model rows and the relevant subject uh, determines uh, the core uh, and per subject there is a specific addition. And in addition, there are the time points that are subject specific. So all these components together uh, build our generative model. So uh, the, the key here is to compute the posterior of this. I won't get into the, uh, the exact notation, but each of these uh, components of the model gives us a conditional distribution uh, over our values. And uh, the data likelihood depends on whether the point that we are evaluating lies within the uh, mo one of the modules or outside. And uh, we developed an algorithm to do this, and the algorithm is uh, a heuristic. Here comes the dirty word. Uh, uh, we start with a bi-clustering solution, either a binary or a continuous, and then we use this as an initial solution and we improve using Gibbs sampling based on our model. So uh, this, of course, requires deriving all the conditional distribution in order to, to run the Gibbs algorithm. And in practice, uh, this works very fast on the data that we have. Uh, it, about 50 iterations or 10 seconds suffice. So how do we get about finding multiple uh, modules? Uh, we do it in the most embarrassingly naive way at this point, because this is just the first uh, shot of the model. Either uh, get uh, multiple by clusters as to start with, run the Gibbs on each, and then remove uh, redundancies. Or even more uh, simplistically, find a single uh, by cluster, improve it, erase its signal from the, uh, from the data and repeat. So there are two variations, the filter and the masker. And we tested this in simulation, both on binary and on uh, continuous data. And uh, the version that combines the BIMAX uh, for bi-clustering plus the Gibbs and the masker worked uh, consistently the best. And we call this algorithm twigs. And, uh, Interestingly, it even does better than uh, uh, when there is no subject-specific information. So we are in the context of regular bi-clustering problem. So we applied this to two problems. The first was uh, data of uh, septic shock uh, of 14 subjects, uh, and for each of them, uh, the uh, DNA, uh, the uh, expression of the genes was measured over uh, five days starting with the day of the shock. And we did the simplest possible thing. We binarized the data and we did divided everything by day uh, one so that uh, everything will be normalized. And we took the genes that uh, changed at least twofold. So this left about 6,000 genes. And when we applied twigs, uh, we got two modules. One contained 11 subject and it was enriched with genes that are related to response to bacteria, which is the primary uh, cause of septic shock. And the second model uh, was enriched with the T cell activity that again is part of the body's response to uh, septic shock. If we look in detail on the first module, what you see here, uh, the uh, red, uh, uh, rectangles are the subjects, and each of them is uh, four uh, white and red stripes, so each stripe is one time point. So you see that some of them uh, contain two, other uh, one, and even four time points, so we see the variability in the module. 
And what you see around each uh, uh, subject is uh, the number, of, uh, uh, the set of functions that were uh, found significantly enriched in the genes that were specific to this subject. So they were not in the core, but they were in the subject-specific part of the core. And uh, interestingly, there are two uh, subjects highlighted in, in yellow that have uh, by far the largest number of enriched functions. And indeed, these are the two subjects that did not survive in this study. So out of uh, all the, all the subjects of this study, two did not survive the septic shock. And, and this method uh, actually identifies them. We also applied this to the brain uh, fMRI data. Here we looked at the data of uh, 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 the brain activity at rest. It is well known that when the brain rests, there is some uh, networks in the brain that uh, start to, to work actively. Some people call it, uh, by analogy, a garbage collection of the brain. Uh, and this was measured over 20 subjects in uh, uh, about 100 time points. And the, al the algorithm found uh, four or five modules, depending on the parameters, but the uh, qualitative results were the same. Uh, and we both got uh, brain regions that are known to be uh, related to rest, and also uh, subject-specific enrichment that uh, shows connections among these regions. And here is one example. There was four subjects that had additional uh, function related to attention. And our uh, neurologist uh, uh, partner in this uh, understood this as uh, there is a subpopulation of people at rest uh, where uh, they are more attentive to sensory stimulation during the thought process. If you look at the number of uh, uh, parcels uh, and at the number of time points included in the different subjects, they are very variable. So we are using the, the full flexibility of the model. So to summarize, uh, we have a probabilistic model for analyzing three-way data that contains both a core part plus subject-specific uh, additions and changes. It works by a Gibbs sampler technique, and it uh, improves over extant method in these two different and very uh, distinct applications. And of course, this is just the first step, and there are many, many uh, uh, places to improve in this method. Okay, happy birthday, Dick. <laughs>